Uh, maybe let's wait one more minute since people are still coming back. Okay, I think we can start now. So, oh, Matthias is there. Oh. Is the microphone okay? It should work. Okay, welcome back. So, we now have the lecture by Matthias about strings in ADS3. Please. Okay, well, thank you very much. So let Recording me remind, in progress. So let me remind you where we got to last time. So we are, uh, we are describing the uh, strings on ADS3, cross S3, cross T4. And so far we've been trying to understand how you describe strings on ADS3 and we've concentrated so far on bosonic strings on ADS3. And the idea is that ADS3 is geometrically a group manifold corresponding to SL2R, except we have to be careful about the periodicity in T, which we will have to undo, and we'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. So ADS3 is really the universal covering group of SL2R. And uh, that factor we can describe in terms of an SL2R by sumino witten model if we are in the situation where we have pure Neuwirth-Schwartz Neuwirth uh, flux. So it's a Vesuvian written model based on the Lie algebra SL2R. And as I explained to you, once you add the Vesuvian term, you get, uh, you get conserved currents. These conserved currents are defined uh, by this expression. And, these, uh, and there's a corresponding formula for the left moving version of those. And they give rise to an affine Katz-Moody algebra, which is uh, this uh, infinite dimensional Lie algebra that I wrote down and that's characterized by level K. And then the idea was that instead of trying to describe all classical solutions, given the fact that this theory has this enormous symmetry, we can use this as a way of organizing the space of states of this theory, and we argued that it should be given the, the Hilbert space. Well, Hilbert space is the wrong word, because it's definitely not a Hilbert space. It has a non, I mean, it's not positive definite. It's the infinite dimensional vector space of, of uh, physical excitations. And it has to organize itself in terms of representations of this affine Katz-Moody algebra, the left moving version and the right moving version. And therefore, schematically, it should be of the form that you have some representation on the left and some representation on the right. And uh, initially, you would naively expect that these representations will be highest weight representations. And what I mean by a high wave representation is that its Fox space is generated by terms of the form negative modes acting on some ground states. And the ground states are annihilated by the positive modes. So these are conventional highest weight representations. So they are killed by the positive modes. And the negative modes freely generate some Fox space. And Normally, you would expect your spectrum just to be described by highest rate representations on the left and highest rate representations on the right. And then the question is, what should this sum over j run over? And what this sum over j labels are uh, these highest rate states. And what I mean by that is that we have an action of the zero modes on, of uh, SL2R on these highest rate states. And specifically, I choose the conventions that the plus mode just shifts uh, I mean, you should, I mean, 
you have obviously seen bracket JM before, if you know the representation theory of SU2. So J will stand for the spin, and M will stand for the magnetic quantum number. So J30 on JM will be just M. And J plus will move you up one step, and then J minus will move you down one step. And in these conventions, obviously there's a, the, I mean, sometimes you write this funny square root bracket factor here. I've decided to rescale my, my, my states so as to absorb this square root factor, and then it bites you here. There'll be a factor here, and the factor that appears here then is m into m minus one minus the Casimir applied to jm. And what is the Casimir? The Casimir operator is the generator ja0, ja0. And if you write it out in terms of this plus minus the generators, it'll be of the form a half times j plus zero, j minus zero, plus j minus zero, j plus zero, minus a half times j three zero, j three zero. So just like for SU2, what you show is that this combination of generators commutes with all the zero modes. So it's what's called the Casimir operator. Therefore, it takes a definite value in each irreducible representation. And what you take the value of this to be in the conventions. And so all of these things look like SU2, except there is a random number of minus signs scattered throughout. So for SU2, there would be a plus sign here. For SL2R, there is a minus sign here. For SU2, this would be J into J plus 1. And for SL2R, it's minus J into J minus 1. So there's always a 50% chance that a plus sign turns into a minus sign. Well, actually, judging by that, it's bigger than 50% because there are more minus signs than plus signs here. But uh, uh, that's, uh, I mean, OK, you have to work a little bit to fix these signs. But uh, it's basically SU2 with some, some small bells and whistles giving rise to signs. So then the question is, what is the, so, so, so what are the values of m that run, runs? Oh, I mean, when I specify j, what I mean by that, I specify the representation. The representation will be given by specifying what value j takes, and therefore what value the Casimir takes. That specifies the action of the zero modes then uniquely. And then I have to specify which, uh, sorry, which values of m mod integer will appear, because the generators move the values of m up and down by integers. So I was mumbling words like Peter Wall theorem. So if you look at the situation where k is large, you can think about this geometrically. And then you can ask, what is the L2 space of SL2R? And it's described in terms of uh, tensor products of representations of, of the finite dimensional rep, uh, of the finite dimensional group, I SL2R. And then the logic is that in the quantum theory, in, this, in the string theory, you should sum over the same set of representations. So what are these representations? For the case of SL2R, what you should, uh, there are two classes of representations that are so-called discrete representations. And they are characterized by j being uh, a real number. And then m, uh, j, m minus j must be an integer. In fact, m minus j must be a positive for the discrete representations of this kind. There's an, another family of discrete representations, but um, I'll just uh, look at those. And in fact, in order for this theory to satisfy the no ghost theorem, that is, once you impose the physical state condition, you end up with a positive definite uh, space of, of states, you have to restrict this j parameter to a finite range. Namely, it has to satisfy that it's bigger than a half. Well, bigger than a half is sort of, a, that's, uh, that goes for free, because, I mean, this is a quadratic relation. So for a given value of Casimir, you can always choose, if it's real, you can always choose j to be bigger than a half. Um, so it's, uh, it's bigger than a half, but then the no-ghost theorem tells you that it also has to be less than k plus 1 over 2. But you see, in the k goes to infinity limit, you don't care. And this is the analog of what you know for SU2. For SU2, the spin runs from a half to k over 2. So this is just the sort of SL2 analog of that. So these are the discrete representations. So here I have to sum over all of them. But you see, this is now an integral because j is real. j is not quantized because SL2R is non-compact. And therefore, you integrate over all the j's that run in this, uh, in this range. So this is really some sort of uh, integral or integral sum. 
And then the second class of representations are the continuous representations, and these will be the real heroes in our story. So we will treat these a little bit, uh, we will sweep them under the carpet, and I'll give you an explanation for why we are allowed to do this later on. Today we'll just pretend that they don't exist, um, but uh, we'll come to that later. And the continuous representations are characterized by the spin formally, well, the spin taking the value a half plus IP, and then if you plug this into the Casimir, what this tells you is that the Casimir is a quarter plus P squared, where P is a real number, and then, you see, I mean, this condition guarantees, this condition guarantees if you stare at this formula that uh, J minus zero on the state JJ is equal to zero. So what these discrete representations look like is they have a, uh, a state here where M is equal to J, and then J plus acts freely, and J minus stops here. So it basically looks like an infinite line, and you have your j plus a zero going to the right, right, and you have j minus going to the left. So you, you increase the eigenvalue of m with j plus, and you decrease it with j minus, but there is a, there is a place where it stops, namely when m is equal to j, this prefactor goes equal to zero, and you see this is sort of like the SU2 representations you are familiar with, except for the SU2 representation, you would look at this range, and here you look at this range. So it's basically, that's what it is. And for SU2, you would choose J to be half integer, whereas here we choose J to be any number, and we just look at what happens to the right. Whereas the continuous representations, so, so they, are, they are sort of semi-infinite, right? They run to the left at infinitum, they never stop, but they stop to the right. There is the smallest value of M, but there is not the largest value of M. And then the continuous representations, they are unbounded in both directions. They run all the way because, you see, once C is of the form of a quarter plus P squared, or rather when J is equal to a half plus IP, since M is equal to real, this prefactor can never become zero. So therefore, this, uh, this sort of a row of J minus operators and J plus operators will never stop. You will go as far to the left as you can go to the right. So, this uh, extends uh, infinitely in both directions. And then because it sto never stops, there aren't any preferred values for M. So then M can really take any value. So the way you, the, the way you say is that M is in the set Z plus alpha. So these continuous representations are actually labeled by two parameters. They're labeled by the spin, which in this language corresponds to the real parameter P, and they're labeled by this parameter alpha, which tells you the quantization condition of m a mod integer. And remember I told you that the folklore is that uh, strings on ADS3 can't, po the, at the pure neuro schwartz neuro schwartz background, which is what I'm describing here, can't be dual to the symmetric orbifold. And the reason I gave was that they have this continuum coming from the long strings out at infinity, and this continuum is exactly this continuum. So this P parameter is basically the momentum out at infinity, and the fact that this is continuous means there is really a continuous spectrum here, even after you impose the physical state condition, and therefore this looks totally different than your symmetric orbifold theory, which has a discrete spectrum. So that's the folklore, and obviously we will have to break the folklore in order to identify the world sheet theory that's exactly dual to the symmetric orbifold, because the symmetric orbifold I mean, on the face of it, it has no chance to match any of these theories. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what you would naively expect, but that's not quite the right answer, and it's not quite the right answer for reasons that has to do with the fact that we're really interested in the universal cover of SL2R rather than the group manifold SL2R itself. Namely, what this part of the spectrum describes, if you think about it in terms of uh, solutions, I mean, so you can ask what are the equations of motions that are, I mean, there's a sort of two dictionaries here. You can either write down the Wessomino Witten model and you can look at the classical equations of motion on G, and you, what you find is the solutions for G are functions of the form sigma and tau that you can write as functions of G plus of X plus times G minus of X minus. This is the, this is the family of of solutions of the Wessermino written model equations of motions. 
right? So, so you could try to start with this and then quantize the phase space produced by all of these solutions. Now here we've sort of gone down a different road. We've said, okay, we know that this theory has this symmetry and therefore we know that this space must organize itself in terms of representations of the affine Katsumudi algebra. So you can ask, how does this language translate into writing down this uh, Fox space of uh, physical states? And the logic is that the states that are described by this Fox space correspond to those maps that have the property that G plus of X plus plus two pi, remember X plus and X minus are tau, uh, sig, uh, tau plus or minus sigma. So these are the world sheet light current coordinate. And it obviously has to be, the world sheet has to be periodic in sigma goes to sigma to two pi. So therefore, this function has to be periodic in sigma when sigma goes to sigma plus two pi. And how do you arrange for that? Well, you arrange for that by saying that G plus of X plus goes to under rotation by two pi goes to G plus of X plus times some fixed matrix and G minus of X minus minus two pi goes to M to the minus one to G minus of X minus. Then obviously the product will be periodic because you see this M will kill this M to the minus one when I multiply them together. So this will describe periodic solutions. And there is this sort of mental dictionary that the matrix here is fixed up to an element up to conjugation. So it lives in the Cartan torus and the different values of J, you can effectively think of describing the different matrices here. So roughly speaking, I don't want to just explain this in detail, but the way you should think about it, the different values of J describe the different monodromies this solution describes, but they all describe strictly periodic solutions for SL2R. Because this is like the analog of what you do for SU2, and for SU2 you want, there is nothing else. But for SL2 there is something else, so this doesn't account for all the interesting solutions because the, 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 the T parameter here is not periodic in, in two pi. I mean, when you write it as a matrix in SL2R, it appears to be periodic in two pi, but it shouldn't be periodic because we want to look at this covering space and therefore we have to include additional solutions. And the additional solutions we have to include They are of the, of, the, of the form that you, so suppose you have a solution of this kind, I'm going to engineer a new solution that will account for the fact that T is not periodic. So what I do is I define G left of WR of X plus to be given of the form of E to the I times WR over two. I'll, I'll, uh, you'll see in a second why this is a, a smart thing to do. X plus times sigma two times G, what I call G zero uh, left of X plus. So this is a solution of this kind. So let's call them G zero here. These are, uh, and they satisfy this sort of periodicity where, where M is a fixed matrix, uh, a fixed matrix in SL2R. And now the, the new solution is I take an old solution of this kind and I multiply G left WR by this factor and G right of W, uh, sorry, this should probably, uh, this is actually an R, and then this is an, an L of X minus. What you do there is you multiply it from the other side. Uh, so I should have called this right. So this is left uh, X minus, and then I multiply it e, e to the I W L over two X minus times sigma two. So, okay, so what I'm claiming is, suppose you have a solution of that kind, I propose let's look at the solution that comes from this function for G plus and this function for G minus. What's the difference? Well, the difference, uh, it's not as, uh, as a monkey can see the difference, is obviously the, the factors of E to the I times something over there. But now remember, and that's the reason why I wrote out these equations over here, how we parameterized the group manifold to start with. So, you see, on the left, we have e to the u times sigma two, and on the right, we have e to the v times sigma two. And the way I'm modifying these solutions is by multiplying them on the, on the, on the left by, yeah, I must admit, this is the world's most stupid convention, 
to call the thing that stands on the left right and the thing that stands on the right left. And as you see, I've confused myself. But so, so this is acting on the left and this is acting on the right despite appearances. So what this means is I take a solution and relative to the solution I have before, what I do is because of this factor, you see this will effectively shift u as a function of uh, x plus. So u will go to u goes to u plus uh, wr over 2. You see it's sigma 2, so it's wr over 2 times, uh, uh, times uh, tau plus sigma. And it will shift v, which is the factor standing on the right here. You see this is the v. So v is what stands on the right, and u is what stands on the left. So u gets shifted by, by this factor, and v gets shifted by the corresponding factor, wl over 2 times tau minus sigma. And now, why is this a smart thing to do? Well, remember that u and uh, v are the light cone coordinates in target space. So if I translate them back into t and phi, t is the sum and phi is the difference. So what this means is that t gets shifted by t plus the sum. So the, the, there will be a term proportional to tau, which will go like a half times w right plus w left. And there will be a term proportional to sigma times a half times w right minus w left. And then phi gets shifted by phi plus tau times a half. And now I have to take the difference. So here there will be w right, right minus w left. And here there will be a half times w right plus w left. Okay, so suppose I have a solution that's described by this G0, then once I modify it in this way, I get a solution whose t and phi dependence, I mean, previously it was periodic, and now it picks up these additional pieces. And now why is this interesting? You see, we want t not to be periodic, so we have to make sure that this factor is equal to zero, right? Because when sigma goes to sigma plus two pi, that describes, must describe the same point, and in order to avoid t being periodically identified, I have to make sure that this factor is equal to zero. So this tells me I have to choose wr is equal to wl. So when I do this, then this term goes, and this term goes, and what I see here, this just becomes wr equals to w left equals to w. So what I find is t goes to t plus w times tau, who cares? Tau is not periodic, t is not periodic. And, and phi goes to phi plus w times sigma, and sigma is 2 pi periodic, and phi is 2 pi periodic. So therefore, I've included now solutions that are not periodic in T, even if I go ar around with sigma by 2 pi. So I've made solutions that were periodic in T into solutions that are not periodic in T. And what I see is, it's not obvious that this accounts for all the possible things, but you at least see that you are producing arbitrary winding in the phi direction, and, uh, but you, are, you have undone the fact that this would have identified also the t direction. Okay, so that's the proposal of Maldesino Noguri was that what you have to do is you have to look at the solutions corresponding to this, but now I've translated it in terms of classical solutions. So in terms of classical solution, I also have to include these new solutions. But because I want to work in that language, I now have to explain what does this modification do on the level of the representations I've written over there? Sorry, the winding in phi, does that have to be integer? So like w is an integer or it can be... Oh yeah, sorry, w has to be an integer, absolutely. Sorry, I, I forgot to say this, yes, absolutely. So w has to be an integer, otherwise I would, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So, so, so here I've explained to you on the level of the classical solutions what I have to do. But I am an algebraic uh, CFT type person. I want to work in that language. So now I have to translate this description into this language. So what I have to do is I have to calculate what happens to the currents when I do this. Remember, the currents are defined by the formula that I also wrote down here. You have to take the trace of the Lie algebra generator, and that's the convention I'm picking, times d plus g, g to the minus 1, and similar for the other currents. So let's work out what happens when I modify my solution in this manner. Okay, so what we do is we take a solution that uh, 
uh, was of the type G0, I, a periodic solution, I, or rather fixed by this uh, fixed monodromy, and now we have to include this factor. So now we, what we want to calculate is that the J A of R is now K times the trace of uh, T A, and now I'm writing out uh, D plus of G my of T of G, and uh, so, okay, so this stuff uh, doesn't, uh, do, okay, so I'll, I'll write it as, let me write it, um, what happens, so I have to apply this to E to the I times W right over two X plus times sigma two times uh, my old G right zero of X plus, then I have G left of X minus, and because I'm interested in the plus derivative, I don't have to write it out, and then I have here G inverse, which is GL X minus to the minus one, G right zero X plus to the minus one, and then I have to write the inverse of that, E to the, I need a bit more blackboard space here, E to the minus I W over two, X plus sigma two, and I should write now W because W right is equal to W left is equal to W is an integer. Okay, so now I have to evaluate that. Now obviously you see the DX plus, I can stop the DX plus the action here because this doesn't depend on X plus. So this term obviously cancels against this term. That makes it already less to write. And now there are obviously two derivatives. The D, the, the D plus can hit here. So what am I going to get? I'm going to get a term that looks like K trace TA and now I'm going to get two terms. If the D plus hits here, I get an I times W over two times sigma two, G zero, and then the G zero R will cancel against this G zero R, so that's all there is. And the other term is plus, if the derivative hits here, then I get E to the I times W over two, X plus times sigma two, D plus of G R zero X plus, times e to the minus i, sorry, times, uh, times uh, g zero r x plus to the minus one, so this is this term, times e to the minus i w over two, x plus sigma two, right? And then, uh, so that's what I have to calculate. Now, if you think about it, you see, this is basically the old current, right? This is the original current, and it's now conjugated by that, but the I can either think of this conjugating or I can think of the conjugation conjugating the TA. So I can write this as K times trace of TA times IW2 over sigma two plus K times trace of uh, E to the minus IW over two X plus sigma two times uh, TA times e to the i times w over two x plus sigma two times, um, I just write it dg, gr, gr to the minus one, the old thing, the one I had before. And now, now it depends a little bit on which component I'm looking at. So if you, so in the convention, so the conventions are, I mean, somebody should have worked a little bit, a bit better on these conventions because there are the sigmas and then there are the t's. So the t, t3 to confuse absolutely everybody, and this has confused me for a long time, I misread their paper many times, is uh, proportional to sigma two. There you go. And uh, then t plus and minus is proportional to sigma three plus and minus sigma one, but uh, that's what it is. The sigmas are the Pauli matrices, so everything is totally explicit. So now we can just work this out. So let's work this out for J3 of R. So when you pick TA to be T3, you see T3 is just equal to, by this funny convention, minus I over two sigma two. Then you have a minus I over two times an I over two gives you plus uh, one over four. Sigma two squared has trace equal to two. So this term just tells you uh, this will be equal to K times uh, W over two plus, so this comes from this term. And then from this term, if uh, sigma two 
uh, since T3 is also proportional to sigma 2, obviously sigma 2 commutes with itself, so this term goes away and you just keep the old current. So what you read off from that is that the three component of the current just gets shifted by a constant term. And what happens to the plus minus component of the current? Well, what you have to do for that is you have to ask what is this for this being equal to plus minus? And that's a little calculation which uh, you probably better do in the privacy of your room than seeing me struggle on the blackboard. I mean, it's not the rocket science. You, 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 I mean, e to the sigma 2, sigma 2 is an explicit matrix, so you can write e to the i sigma 2 as an explicit matrix. It's basically cosine, sine, sine, cosine, and then you just uh, multiply this through. And what you find at the end of the day, and it's uh, a very elementary calculation, but I'm not going to do it for you here, is that this is equal to e to the minus plus i times w times x plus times t plus minus. So the t plus minuses go back to themselves, but they pick up a phase e to the i, e to the minus plus i w x plus. So what this tells you is that j plus minus r, you see for them this term is zero because the trace of sigma two with sigma plus minus is zero because the traces of the, of the different sigmas are, are zero. So, so this term is absent. And this term, you just pick up this phase, and then you have, to, again, the old current. So what you learn from that is that this is equal to e to the minus plus i w x plus times j plus minus r of x plus. That's what you calculate. So that's the, that's the sort of algebraic description of having introduced these additional solutions. Right? I'm, I'm taking these additional solutions, and I'm translating it what it means from the point of the, the affine cuts moody symmetry, and that's what it means. Yes? Okay. Uh, there is a bit of a confusing point here for me, because you introduced uh, this extra solution because uh, you want to describe universal cover. But uh, even if you want to describe just SL2R, uh, yeah, you should include them, but uh, no, for WR is not equal to WL, or not? No, but I mean, if I'm looking at SL2R, then I have to be, then, um, then it has to be periodic in, in T, right? So you're saying it's also periodic in T? Yes, you just need that uh, WR minus WL is a multiple of 4 pi. Well, or, sorry, in this convention, Ah, uh, yeah, so you would have to use something like that, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe you have to do this for SL2R as well, yeah. So it, it, it seems to me that uh, going from SL2R to the universal cover is not adding new solution, but restricting. Yeah, you, you, you're, you're, well, I mean, but, but then that's not compatible with this, right? Are you saying WR minus WL has to be equal to a, a multiple of pi or 2 pi? 4 pi, maybe. 4 pi, whatever. Yeah, so maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Maybe there's also additional solutions for... I think you're right. There's probably also additional solutions if I don't go to the universal cover. But if I go to the universal cover, I have this constraint on this class of additional solutions. And in fact, this is... I mean, you see, for SU2, you, you may ask, why don't I have to do the same for SU2? And for SU2, if you were to do the same thing, you would actually land on the same spectrum. You're not introducing new degrees of freedom because, I mean, this will turn out to be spectral flow, and the spectral flow maps the SU2 representations, again, back to standard highest weight representations. So normally, you're probably right, one has to include these sectors as well, but for SL2R, they generate new representations, as I'm about to explain. And, and you're right, the universal cover is not responsible for adding new solutions. They're there anyway. It's more responsible for removing some. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me explain to you what this means in terms of the affine cuts moody algebra. So remember, we have this uh, melt expansion, JAR of X plus. I said you can write as a sum over JAN, and I think I forgot a minus sign here yesterday. There should be e to the minus i n X plus, otherwise I'm going to run into trouble now. So that's the consistent solution with everything else I'm doing. So when you translate this, you see what this means is that J3, uh, so J3N, the new J3N, is the old J3n, 
And then the constant term means that the zero mode term gets shifted. So plus k times w over two delta n comma zero. And what you find for j plus minus n is that this is the old j zero plus minus, but now n gets shifted up and down in terms of w because you see this factor basically just shifts the mode number because I mean this just multiplies to the exponent and thereby you shift the mode number. And when you, what you find is that this is the set of transformations you get. And what this means is the new solutions are described, you can think of them as being described on the Fox space of the old solutions, except that the SL2R now acts in a modified way. So, so, so you have the old Fox space on which the J0s act like they acted before, but now on the same Fox space I define a new action where the new modes are defined in terms of the old modes plus corrections. And in fact, what you can check is that this is an automorphism of the affine Katsumudi algebra associated to SL2R, i.e. these guys satisfy the same commutation relations as the original guys if you redefine them in that manner. So this is an automorphism, and whenever you have an automorphism and you have a representation, then the automorphism produces for you a new representation. Now, there's no guarantee that it's a genuine new representation. It may be the old representation in disguise, but at least potentially it's a new representation. Normally you would think it's a new representation. If the automorphism is outer, then generically you get a new representation. If the automorphism is inner, then you won't. Then you're just relabeling the states. Now, you can check that this is, a, that this is an, in general an outer automorphism, and the reason for that is you see that it shifts the mode number in this funny way. So if we start with the highest weight representation, and so on the highest weight representation, you remember we had J0 plus M on the state JM is equal to zero for N bigger than zero. That was it, what it meant to be a highest weight representation. But now, if I think about it in terms of the action of J plus N, J plus N acts on these states by saying that this is the same as J0 plus N minus W acting on these states. So this is only zero if N is bigger than W. So what this means is that there are some negative J plus modes that will not annihilate the highest weight state. And as a consequence, it's not a highest weight representation. It's a representation where there are certain negative modes that you can apply as many, many times as you want and they will always be non-trivial. And uh, so, so, so these are generically not highest rate representations. You can also see it in terms of the uh, Virasoro algebra. So if you look at it in terms of the, uh, if you ask uh, what does the Virasoro generators do under this modification, now there is sort of an, an abstract way of doing this because you know the commutation relations of the, of the Virasoro generator with the currents I mean, you know that uh, the LN generators has to, with the JAM generators, have to satisfy this commutation relation. And then compatibility with this will tell you how L transforms. And what you find is that LM transforms as LM0 minus uh, W times j 3 m uh, minus k over four times w squared delta m comma zero. This term you only see if you insist that they still satisfy Virasoro algebra. And this term you get by simply demanding that uh, this is also an automorphism under this, under this transformation. And you see because of this term and the fact that the J30 spectrum is always unbounded to the positive line, if I take w to be positive, then the zero mode of L0 will be unbounded. So, so, so these representations are not included in what I had before, because before I had a bounded L0 spectrum, because I had a highest weight state and the positive modes killed it and L0 move you up. And now once I've included the spectrally flowed sectors, I've genuinely produced new representation with an unbounded L0 spectrum, but this hinges on the fact that these representations are infinitely extended to the right and therefore that this eigenvalue can become as negative as you want. In particular, if you think about doing the same thing for SU2, you see for SU2 you have finite dimensional highest weight representations. And what you find is that after you have applied this spectral flow to an SU2 representation, 
you just get another SU2 representation. And for SU2, what you find, I mean, for those people who are sort of familiar with this, sigma will map the jth representation to the representation associated to k minus 2 over j. So it'll just flip around the, so it's order 2, so sigma squared will be trivial, will map a representation to itself. Sigma 2 is, sigma squared is inner, sigma is outer. And in fact, this has to do with the fact that SU2 is a double cover of SO3. And what this is really implementing is the quotient going down to SO3. But this is just as a side comment. But what's important here is that we genuinely get new representations. And therefore, this spectrum that I wrote down before was really too small because it didn't include any of these solutions. So I have to include my spectrum. And now the, 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 the correct answers for what my, my Fox space of this world sheet theory should be is that there should be a sum over these winding sectors and I'll restrict myself secretly to W bigger than zero. Then I have this integral over J or sum over J and then I will have, and I write this uh, like, like such. So by this I mean the, the representation induced by this automorphism, sigma to the W, and I apply this uh, simultaneously to left and right movers because W right times W left is equal to W. So this is basically the Maldacena or Gourou spectrum. And as I explained to you, the spectrally flowed sectors come from the fact that you have to have these uh, periodic solutions that are periodic in phi but not periodic in T. Well, I mean, so, I mean there, that you have these additional solutions because SO2R has these additional solutions and then the fact that we are, we are in, the, in the universal cover means that W right is equal to W left rather than the difference is something funny. Okay, so this is, this is the spectrum we, we have to work with. And now the idea is that now we've identified this world sheet spectrum, now the aim of the game is that we are going to uh, work out the, um, the, um, uh, the, the physical states that satisfy uh, the physical state condition. But before we do that, there is uh, one more thing we have to do. Now I'm losing track of my notes. Oh, yeah. So, so, so far we have done everything bosonic. And bosonic is fine, but it captures the essence of the spectral flow. But in order to really get the symmetric orbifold, we have to deal with the superstring. So, what's the superstring version? You see, so far I've really only concentrated on the ADS3 factor and only concentrated on the bosonic spectrum. Now I have to look at the superstring version. So what's the superstring version? Well, so the, the superstring version is actually relatively easy to describe. So what happens is, you see, we had this SL2R bosonic algebra level K. And if I look, there's a natural supersymmetric generalization of it. And the natural supersymmetric generalization consists of writing an upper index and writing a one. That means it's n equals to one superconformal. And what does this algebra consist of? Well, this algebra consists of the generators J, A, N that satisfy an SL2R level K affine Katz-Moody algebra with the commutators I wrote down before. But then in addition, you have fermions that also transform in the adjoint representation of SL2R. So there are three fermions. Uh, psi 3 and sub psi plus minus. And uh, so the J's with themselves give you an SL2R. And the J's with the, with the, uh, with the, with the psi's give you just the, they sit in the adjoint representation, so they just transform as somebody who sits in the adjoint representation. So I hope this is, uh, so these are the structure constants of SL2R. So, so 3 with plus gives you, pl um, plus times plus, uh, three with minus gives you minus times minus, and so on. So it's, uh, it's just the, the, the transform in the adjoint representation, and then the size by themselves just satisfy their free fermions. So the non-trivial anti-commutators they satisfy are of the form psi, uh, and again, there's a funny minus sign because we are in SL2R, so there's a minus, uh, sorry, there's a K over, uh, there's a K, there's a factor of k here, and there's a factor of minus k over 2 here. So, so going to the superstring is basically means you replace the bosonic algebra SL2R by the sort of supersymmetrized version. And the way you think about it, this is like NSR normally functions. I mean, these are the bosonic degrees of freedom of your target space. 
And for each boson dx mu, you add the fermion psi mu. So the fermion has the same labels. It also sits in the adjoint representation. It transforms under the bosons in the adjoint representation. We can't really do anything but, and then it's a free fermion just because there's nothing else you can do. Okay, so that's basically the SUSY version for ADS3. So that's what you have to do for ADS3. And then you have to do the analogous thing for SU2. For SU2, you also enhance the SU2 level K prime affine Katzmudi algebra by adding in fermions in the adjoint representation of SU2, and they satisfy the analogous commutation relations as that. And then the T4 is the T4. Now, now we want to, so the first thing I have to explain to you is why the level of the SL2R is quantized. I was asked this earlier. And the reason for that is that it must be equal to the level of the SU2. So let me explain how this comes about. Now, when you look at these uh, super uh, conformal, uh, super affine algebras, you have to, you can ask yourself, what's the central charge? And the central charge, there's a, there's a, a clever way of calculating the central charge, and that's sometimes useful. Um, you see, this is a coupled system. So, I mean, how do you calculate central charge? You try to separate it into blocks, and then you just add that com pairwise commute with one another, and then you add the central charges of the blocks. Now, here you can't do that because the stupid fermions transform under the bosons. So, you can't just say it's the bosons plus the fermions because they're not, you have to disentangle them. Now, in fact, you can disentangle them. And uh, that's what goes under this uh, decoupled current. So this is meant to be a different letter than this J. This is a more curly version of this letter J. And what you do is you define new generators, new currents, which are the old currents, and you correct them by terms that are bilinear in the fermions. And they look uh, explicitly like that. So for J plus uh, minus, you just uh, do that. And then for J3, you, you take uh, these J3s, and then the way you decouple is that you add to it the term J minus J plus. I mean, these are to be understood as normal ordered products of these psi's. So what you do is you take your currents and you add to them suitable fermionic uh, bilinear terms. And then what you can prove, and that's a little exercise, is that these currents then commute with the fermions. You basically remove the fermionic piece of the currents so that these guys commute with the fermions and they still satisfy an SL2R affine Katzmudi algebra, but their level has been shifted. So they now satisfy SL2R, not at level K, but at level K plus two. I mean, for people who know what's secretly happening here is that the free fermions themselves build an SL2R algebra at level two and you're basically sort of taking the coset. You're sort of taking them out, and then, or rather minus two, taking them out, and then you get this term plus the decoupled fermions. So, so, but now it's very easy to calculate the central charge that comes from this factor. So when I calculate the central charge of ADS3, so you see for ADS3, I have this SL2R supersymmetrized level K, then I have S3, then I have SU2 supersymmetrized level K prime. And then I have a T4. So let's calculate the central charges. Well, so I have to calculate the central charge of this decoupled SL2R. Now, the central charge of a, of an, of a bosonic SL2R at level K is 3k into k minus 2. So now when I shift this, what I get is I get a 3k plus 2 into over k. This comes from the, from the decoupled SL2R currents because they're at level k plus 2. Then I, from the fermions, I get 3 halves because three free fermions give me 3 halves. Each fermion contributes a half to the central charge. Then I do the same thing for SU2. So for SU2, what happens is for SU2 level one, level K is the same as SU2 bosonic at level K minus two plus three fermions. So here for SU2 level K, the central charge is three K minus, uh, so if this is at K prime, so this will give me, so this is at K prime. 
So this will give me three times k prime minus two over k prime plus three halves. And then the torus will give me six because the torus is four bosons, which gives me four, and four fermions. Each fermion gives a half. That's another two. So altogether six. And this uh, has to be equal to 15. That's the critical dimension of superstring theory, right? I mean, the no ghost theorem tells me that I have to live in the critical dimension. So that has to be C equals to 15, which corresponds to a superconformal theory in 10 dimensions, 10 bosons, and 10 times five fermions, 10 times fermion, 10 times a half fermions give you 15. And if you stare at this, you see you get a three from here, plus six over K, plus three halves, plus three minus six over K prime, plus three halves, plus six. And now you see three plus three halves, plus three plus three halves, plus six is equal to 15. So therefore, what you learn is that six over k minus six over k prime has to be equal to zero, and therefore you learn that k has to be equal to k prime. I mean, this is also familiar from a supergravity perspective. That's just saying that the radius of the ADS space has to be the same as the radius of the three sphere. That's the supersymmetric supergravity solution. But this, the CFT version of it is that uh, in order to get a critical string theory, the level of the SU2 and the level of the SL2R have to be equal, have to be equal to one another. And therefore, because the SU2 level is quantized, the SL2 level has now also turned out to be quantized because they have to be equal to one another. There's a question? Yeah. So, sorry, I have a question on, on the shifting on, of the level. Uh, maybe I'm confusing myself, but uh, with, with the different conventions, but um, also in the bosonic, uh, in the bosonic WZW model, you have a shift uh, of the level by the dual Coxeter number. Well, that only appears in the central charge. The central charge formula yes. of, uh, S, uh, of G level K is K times the dimension of G divided by K plus the dual Coxeter number. So that's, for example, why for SU, so for SU2 level K, this gives you th uh, three times K because the dimension of SU2 is three, and it gives you K plus two because the dual Coxeter number of SU2 yes. is two. and if I'm now, not wrong, for SL2R, is the, there is a minus yeah, sign. Yeah, so no? for the SL2R, exactly. For SL2R, basically, the, you can think of it as the dual Coxeter number being equal to minus two. Uh, so is, is it true that uh, by adding fermions, uh, I have an opposite shift? Uh, Absolutely. So, yes. okay, so this okay. is actually a very important point. So you notice here, you get a factor of one over K and one over k prime here, oh, okay. whereas in the bosonic case, you would have had a factor of one over k plus two and one over k prime minus two or whatever. Now, why is that important? Remember, k is the radius. So if you think about it like you weren't smart and you took this Wessomino written model, you turned it into Feynman diagrams and you would do a Feynman calculation, then the powers of one over k is basically the higher loop corrections as you would calculate it from a Feynman diagram. And then in the Bosoni case, you would have something like one over K plus the dual Coxeter number. And the way you think about it is that this is one over K times one, my, one plus H dual over K to the minus one. So this is one over K times the sum from N is equal to zero to infinity of, um, well, uh, H bar, uh, over k minus this to the power n, right? So what you would see is you get infinitely many corrections in perturbation theory if you treated this naively in perturbation theory. Now what happens in the SUSY theory, you see, the SUSY theory is sort of not renormalized, and that's manifesting itself that the central charge will involve just the unshifted level, and therefore it's one loop exact. You don't get any higher order correction terms. So that's the reason why this is exactly opposite and uh, that's a, a hint that uh, Susie is doing something good for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so, this is, uh, so this is basically, so now we know that we have to live at the same level, and now we just have to put everything together and, uh, and uh, analyze the physical spectrum. Now I'm out of my many, many, right. So, so now what we have to do is we have to, so now, so let's write down the spectrum. And actually, so, so here there's some small subtlety. You see, 
I, I explained to you spectral flow on the level of the SL2 Arbes Umino Witten model, but now you're going to ask yourself, so should I spectrally flow the, the J's or should I spectrally flow the curly J's? Right? I mean, they're both SL2 Arbes Umino Witten models and I told you how to flow them, so which one should I flow? And the answer is it doesn't matter. So why does it not matter? Well, because you see, spectrally flowing the J's and spectrally flowing the curly J's differs by whether you spectrally flow the fermions or not. There's an analogous way in which you can spectrally flow the fermions, but for the fermions, if you spectrally flow them, you're just rearranging the states. You're not generating any new states in your, in your Fox space. Just like with SU2 level K, where the spectral flow just maps the Jth representation into K over 2 minus J representation over the fermions, it just uh, re reassembles the the states, so whether you spectrally flow the fermions or not is up to you. You're not describing a different spectrum, you're just describing them slightly differently, and it's more convenient to actually spectrally flow the coupled SL2R generators because the coupled SL2R generators are the geometric ones. Because geometrically, the fermions will also feel the Mobius symmetry, so they should also transform under, say, the zero mode, so decoupling the fermions is just a trick for the purpose of calculating the central charge, but the real SL2R is the coupled one because the fermions, I mean, these are the tension vectors, they live in the tension space to the manifold, they also feel the rotation of SL2R, and to remove them would be artificial. So what we are going to do is we are going to spectrally flow also the fermions, i.e. we spectrally float the coupled generators rather than the decoupled generators, and what this means is that the K that will appear here is really the K I'm talking about here, rather than K minus two or K plus two for the case of SL2R and SU2. So I'm, I'm, I'm flowing the full generators. And then on this resulting Fox space, which will look, so there's, the, so there's the SL2 factor. So again, this will look like a sum over W, then I will have the sum over J, and then sigma to the W HJ. But now these are the super conformal representations, but uh, that we are happy with. And then I have a similar factor for SU2. This is like the covariant description of string theory, right? This, is, uh, this involves the time direction. ADS3 contains the time direction. So in order to describe the physical string states, I have to impose uh, the physical state condition. So this will be the condition that GR of phi is equal to zero for R bigger than zero. And I'm thinking of here working in the Novi Schwartz sector. There's always a Novi Schwartz sector and a Roman sector, but the Novi Schwartz sector is the interesting one. And then you have ln on phi minus a half times delta n comma zero on phi is equal to zero for n greater or equal than zero. So these are the, the physical state conditions. This is just like if you open green schwartz witten you do a flat uh, superstring. That's what you have to impose in covariant quantization, right? It's the, it's the usual n equals to one superconformal symmetry you have to impose. And in the nervous schwartz sector, the mass shell condition L0 has to be equal to a half. That's the mass shell condition in order to get the no ghost theorem going. So now what we have to do is we have to evaluate, we have to look for the states that satisfy these conditions. We have to enumerate all of them. And then we want to find out what their space-time charges are, and that will describe for us the space-time spectrum of this specific world sheet theory. So what does, so the interesting condition here is that L0 has to be equal to a half. So what does this mean? Well, remember, we have to work with the real L0, and in the spectrally flowed representation, L0 gets shifted in that way. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to spectrally flow, um, yeah, so, so this is, a, I'm going to use exactly this formula. So the L0 condition will amount to the following. It will amount to the H0 of SL2R. So for my, for my level, for my SUSY theory at level K, uh, plus the H0 of the rest. So the rest will be SU2. So the rest is uh, SU2 plus the torus. So this will be the ground state conformal I mentioned. Then there will be some excitation number. This is the total excitation number coming from everybody. And that has to be equal to a half, right? That's the mass shell condition that I will have to impose on this spectrum, right? You have, a, you have the SL2 factor and the rest. The rest is SU2 and T4. This is the conformal dimension of the ground state of SL2. That's the conformal dimension of the ground state of SU2. 
that's the excitation number, and I'm, I'm thinking of looking at states that are in the, in the vacuum of the T4. I could also include that. Doesn't really matter for the analysis, just to be simple. And this factor, for this factor, I now have to use the fact that this is spectrally flowed. So this will be the ground state energy before spectral flow, and the ground state energy before spectral flow is the Casimir, so this will be minus j into j minus one, divided by k, right? Because in the Zuzi theory, I, I get this shift, uh, uh, it's uh, the, the, the Shukawara construction will have a level a k down here, uh, for the same reason that we discussed before. And then uh, it'll be uh, uh, minus uh, w times uh, m. So m I will call the eigenvalue of j03 before I apply the spectral flow. So this is the eigenvalue of this guy. And then I have to uh, subtract minus k over 4 times w squared. So that is uh, what this term is. And then I have plus h0 rest plus n is equal to a half. So this is the Maschel condition I have to solve. And now I'm going to solve this uh, Maschel condition for you and explain to you that we get something interesting. So let's just do this. This is a, maybe I can do this. Uh, yeah, perhaps uh, you can take another five minutes. Is yeah, that it, enough? It, it'll, yeah, it'll be five minutes. It's, it's, okay. very, it's a very simple, I mean, it's uh, very, very elementary, except uh, it's quite key, so. I would quite like to explain it today, and then we can discuss its consequences. So what I'm going to do, and at this stage, I'm just declaring this. So I'm going to set k is equal to 1. That I've told you before, that you are used to. And now I'm going to say that j is equal to a half times i times 0. So I'm going to look at the continuous, only continuous representations. I'm only going to look at the one for which p is equal to 0. Now, the justification at this moment is non-existent, but I'll promise you next time I'll begin to explain to you that this is what you have to do if you look at it from the hybrid formalism. In this language, it's not obvious why these are the right representations to look at, but grant me, just look at these representations and see what happens. Okay, so what's the Casimir? Well, the Casimir is a quarter. So what does this equation become like? This becomes a quarter minus W times M minus a quarter times the w squared is uh, plus uh, h0, and I stop writing this rest stuff now, plus n is equal to a half. Okay, so now this equation I have to solve. And remember, in the continuous representation, the eigenvalues of, a, of j3, 0 are up to me, because the continuous representations, remember, they are labeled by cj alpha, and m has to be of the form alpha plus z, but I can simply take this equation to solve for m and then declare that that means I'm looking at a representation with the corresponding value of alpha. And because all values of alpha appear inside this direct sum, so if I'm looking at the continuous representations, I would sum over all values of j and alpha, there will be one term in this sum where this Maschel condition will be satisfied. So I have in mind, I take a specific descendant and I ask, for which term in this integral does it satisfy the Maschel condition? And I'm saying, okay, I'll just take this equation, I'll solve it for m, then m tells me which alpha, and that picks out the term in this integral where it ma matches the Maschel condition. Okay, so I solve this for m. Okay, that's not difficult. I just bring wm to the other side. So what is this? wm is then equal to minus a quarter, a half minus a, a quarter minus a half, minus a quarter w squared. Matthias, sorry, just to say that the equation should be equal to zero, right? So. Say again? The equation equal to zero. So the, the quality, the equation misses equal to zero, I'm here. It's equal to a half. Ah, there is an equality sign. I oh, mean, sorry. this is in the neve schwartz sector of a Ramon neve schwartz sector string. I thought it was a minus and the equal, because I can't see from here, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, no, this is, this is equal to a half. And this is this a half. This is the usual a half ground state energy in the Schwartz. Yeah, 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 sorry. Okay, so, so this is the equation, okay. But now remember that we are not interested in M. M is the J30 eigenvalue before spectral flow, and we are interested in the J30 eigenvalue after spectral flow because that's the real J30, right? The other thing is just a, a way of describing these representations. So the real J30 eigenvalue 
Remember that J30 is equal to J030 plus KW over 2. And this is this eigenvalue if denoted by M. Remember, that was the term that appeared in the shift formula for the conformal dimension. So if I'm interested in this, and remember, this is the scaling dimension of the dual CFT. So this I can also call H and think of it as the conformal dimension as looked at from the point of view of the space-time theory. So for that, I should not look at M. I should add to M K over W. Well, first of all, I should divide by W. But that's not hard. And then in order to find out the state, the space-time conformal dimension of the corresponding state, what I have to do is I have to add K W over 2, which is just W over 2. But look, there's W over 2, and this term is minus W over 4. So what I'm going to get is W over 4 minus 1 over 4 W, which comes from here, plus, and let's uh, set H0 to 0 for simplicity, plus N over W. Now, now it depends whether you've seen the symmetric orbifold before or not. If you have seen the symmetric orbifold before, you should say, aha. Uh -huh. If you haven't, you should not say anything. And from your reaction, I assume you haven't seen it before. So that's what I'll explain to you next time. But this is exactly the conformal dimension spectrum of a symmetric orbifold, where this is the Casimir energy of the ground state. And this is what you expect for the symmetric orbifold of T4. And the excitation numbers in the spectrally flow in the W cycle twist detector, and I'll explain this next time, are not integer moded. They are fractionally 1 over W moded. So this exactly reproduces the spectrum of the symmetric orbifold. So obviously, I have, so what I'll explain to you next time is the other way of getting at this formula from the symmetric orbifold. And then I have to answer all the nasty little questions is, why was I allowed to do that? And what happens to all the other degrees of freedom and all the rest of it? And then the proper answer to that, I'll, I'll give you some hand-waving answer. And then the proper answer will be the hybrid description where there's a very clean answer where this comes out of the representation theory of the super Lie algebra and where all the degrees of freedom do exactly the right thing to match then exactly the spectrum of the symmetry. But here you see the first sign that you're on the right track. This, this looks to somebody who's seen a symmetric orbifold spectrum before like the symmetric orbifold spectrum. So now you just have to dot the I's and cross the T's to make sure everything works out and it does work out. But that requires a little bit more work. But since I'm over time, I'll stop here. Let's talk. Okay. Recording stopped.